If we have Jesus, we have life. That's the good news that we're going to hear from God's Word today as our study of the Gospel of John continues in chapter 17. Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm Steve Schwetz, your host on this five-year journey through God's entire Word, and I am so glad that you've hopped aboard the Bible bus as our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, walks us to the home of Mary and Martha as Jesus is about to raise Lazarus from the dead. Now, before we begin our study, let's take a quick minute to hear from Natalia. She's a listener who hops aboard the Bible bus from her home in Russia. After my husband divorced me, I lost my orientation in life. I found myself at a dead-end road and began to look for a way out. At that time, the Lord knocked at my door. I have a colleague, Vera. She told me the story of Saul, who went to torture Christians and instead found Jesus along the way. This story was, to me, something incredible, fresh, and new. It was as if somebody turned on the light. Missionaries from different countries came into my life, and I learned so many more wonderful stories about God. God gave me another marriage, and with my loved one, we just celebrated our seventh anniversary. From our first marriages, we have two daughters and a son. We pray now for their salvation. Together, we go to church and serve the Lord according to our abilities. Your programs are an important part of our growth. Please pray that more people in Russia will hear the good news and find Jesus. Well, if you'd like to join me and thousands of others in praising God for his work in the life of this listener and then asking to multiply the ministry of his word in hearts of listeners around the world and especially in Russia, as Natalia asked, then you need to join our world prayer team today. Just go to ttb.org forward slash pray. Natalia will thank you along with many others. Now let's pray together as we open to John chapter 11. Heavenly Father, we're blessed by those who turn people to your word to receive salvation, comfort, and strength. So we pray, Lord, that many more would herald the joy of studying the scriptures. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. You will recall that the Lord Jesus delayed his coming to Bethany and the home of Martha and Mary and Lazarus actually waiting for Lazarus to die. And now he's on the way there, and Thomas tells the other disciples, let us go, we may die with him. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. That's verse 17. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off. Very frankly, I think I'd be able to make that trip by foot. I walked around that area. I didn't walk exactly from Bethany over to Jerusalem, but it would be a nice little walk, but not bad at all. And we're told here in verse 19, and many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Actually, she's rebuking him. Why didn't he come on? In other words, he delayed two days. And now she says, if you just only been here, my brother had not died. She reveals a wonderful faith, but also an impatience and a lack of bending to the will of God. Whereas I believe Mary although she, I think, concurred with Martha in this, she was willing to sit at home, and this woman learned to sit at Jesus' feet. Now, we find in verse 22, but I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. In other words, she has just a faint glimmer of faith that he can raise the dead. Now, he had raised the dead before, but even only a glimmer. You couldn't say that she had real faith. She said, I just know that whatsoever you ask of God. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Now, this woman believed in the resurrection. She was a believer. Now, notice verse 25 and 26. This is another one of the great statements of our Lord. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. 
actually, what does he mean? He that believeth in me, though he were dead. Well, that's spiritual death. That is the thing that he's talking about here, that though he's spiritually dead, he shall live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And now he looks to the future, and that the one that has trusted him shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. This was the testimony, you'll recall, of Simon Peter. And it's a very important testimony at this particular time. And when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, The Master is come and calleth for thee. As soon as she heard that, she rose quickly, came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. When she heard he was coming, she went out to meet him. And there are quite a few roads that go by Bethany, even today. If you go down to Jericho, you take the road and go right by old Bethany there. Still a few people living there. Now I'm reading verse 31. The Jews then, which were with her in the house, and comforted her, when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Had not died, my brother is actually the way it should be because in the Greek, that which is important is put first. My brother had not died, you see. And that is the thing that she's emphasizing. Had not died my brother. And again, she's now in sympathy with Martha in this. If you'd only been present. Now, that's one of the reasons that the Lord Jesus will say a little later, it's expedient for you that I go away. It's better, he said, for me to go away, for me to leave. And one of the reasons is made obvious right here. Had he been here in the flesh, continued here in the flesh, why, if he were today in your town, wherever you're listening, he couldn't be here with us. And if he's here with us today, he couldn't be with you out yonder listening in so that it'd be impossible for him to be at every place at the same time. But he says, it's expedient for you that I go away. If I go not away, why, the Holy Spirit will not come, the Comforter. But if I go, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, and he'll be everywhere, you see. He's where you are today, and he's where I am today. And he's on the other side of the world in India. Everywhere there are believers, he indwells them today. Now, will you notice verse 33? When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. In other words, if you want to know how God feels about the death of your loved ones, look at this. He groaned in his spirit, he's troubled. Death is a frightful thing, actually. And you can be sure of one thing, that he enters into sympathy with you. But you see, his sympathy is for the living. Actually, was not for the dead, because he knew what he's going to do. And he said, Where have ye laid him? And they said unto him, Come and see. And then we read on the way out, Jesus wept. And this is the way God feels at your funeral. He joins you in shedding tears, by the way, but not for the loved one that's in Christ, because it's far better to go and be with Christ, but for you in your loss. Death is not a pleasant thing. Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. I think the Jews missed it here. Behold how he loved them. That is, how he loved the living that were there that were weeping. Now, and some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? And you see, they go back to that incident of the opening of the eyes of the blind. That apparently made a profound impression upon Jerusalem and all the surrounding area, you see, if that had not been true. Now, Jesus, therefore, again groaning himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. 
Now notice this byplay here. Jesus said, take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. You see, decay had set in in the body. That's what happens to our bodies. And I don't care what the undertakers do to it today, friends. Oh, they made death a very pleasant little episode today. And I don't mean to be critical of undertakers because they've been my friends. I've worked with them for years. But very frankly, let's face up to it that you can't cover up death by embalming and painting up the face and putting a suit of clothes on it, putting it in a nice coffin and putting flowers on around it. Now, somebody says, don't you think that should be done? Yes, I do, because it softens the shock. But if you want to know the truth, death is an awful thing. <laughs> Let's face up to it. This is what happens to the body, but the individual, whether he's saved or lost, has moved out of that body. The saved, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Now, Jesus saith unto her, said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldst believe, thou should see the glory of God. You remember he said this would be for the glory of God. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. He didn't need to pray this prayer. I need to pray, but he didn't need to pray this prayer. He did this for the benefit of those that were there to help their faith. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And that was always his method when he raised the dead. And I want to add this, that there were not just three or four that are mentioned in the Gospels that were raised from the dead. There were, I think, multitudes. We said that not just a few blind, but probably hundreds. And there were great many people that had been raised from the dead. And notice this, and he that was dead came forth bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto him, Loose him and let him go. Have you noticed the difference between the resurrection of Lazarus and the resurrection of Jesus? And when you see the contrast and the difference, you'll see that this was merely a restoration to the life in the old body. We call it a resurrection. But when Jesus came forth from the dead, he left those grave clothes and he left that napkin wrapped about his head. He just came right up out of it. Why? Because he came out in a glorified body. And they didn't need to roll away the stone for Jesus to come forth. They needed to roll away the stone to let those outside on the inside. That was the reason that stone was rolled away. It wasn't rolled away to let him out at all. That is something that we need to see. Remember, he came right into the room and the door was locked, and he came right into where they were. Now, notice the result of this. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did, they believed on him. They believed on him. And some of them, now notice this, some of them went their way to the Pharisees and told them what things had done. Now, as I suggested at the very beginning, you see, these men were pretty close by just simply because of the fact that this is something that didn't make those believe in that day. And I want to say now that through this miracle, he's making his last public appearance before his death. This will be his last public appearance. Now, this may be in the very nature of it a surprise to some of you to learn that we've now come to the end of the public ministry of Jesus. When you realize that we're not near the end of the Gospel of John, that could be quite a shock to you. But we're just about to the halfway mark, a little past it maybe, midway in the Gospel. And now we're at the termination of his public ministry, which began when John the Baptist marked him out as the Lamb of God. So that when we begin chapter 13 through to the end, we are in the last week of his ministry. In fact, the last few days, yea, we are in the last day before his death. And John, you see, spends almost as much time on the last 48 hours of our Lord before the cross 
as he does on the first 32 years and 11 months and three weeks and five days of his life. In fact, this is the pattern shared by all the gospel writers. They place the emphasis on the last eight days. Look at this statement, and this is a compelling statement, friends, and it's something that's worth noting. There are 89 chapters in the four Gospels. There are four chapters of the first 30 years of the life of Christ. There are 85 chapters of the last three years of the life of Christ. And of those 85 chapters, 27 of those chapters deal with the last eight days of his life. About one-third of the Gospels deal with the last few days, and the emphasis is on the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ upon the cross and the empty tomb. Now, where do you think they're putting the emphasis? They're putting the emphasis upon the death and resurrection of Christ. Now, suppose you were telling me about a trip you'd made to Washington, D.C., and I asked you, well, how did it impress you? Well, you would tell me that you went around into the city of Washington, and just very casually, you tell me about the crowded conditions of the hotels and the traffic that is there. And you very casually tell me about the government buildings that you went into the great museum there and that you went through the Capitol and you saw the Senate and the House, of but you just barely touched on it. And you said that you went up in the Washington Monument and casually mentioned that. And you went over to the Lincoln Memorial and the Jefferson Memorial. You saw the grave of the unknown soldier. And then you began to tell me about your trip to the White House. And you spend about two-thirds of your time telling me about the trip that you made to the White House. You see, I'd misrepresent you if somebody asked me, well, what sort of a trip did so-and-so have to Washington, and I'd say to you, my, they sure did enjoy going into the department stores there. I'd misrepresent you. Friends, you misrepresent the Bible if you don't put the emphasis upon the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. You see, the gospel writers did what Paul later on did. Paul says, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, let's tie this last public appearance of Jesus with the raising of Lazarus. Now, you'd think the raising of Lazarus would have convinced the most dubious of men. It did not. You'd think this crowning miracle should have turned the skeptical to Jesus. It did not. Our Lord had said previously, you remember in a parable, he said unto him, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. That's in the parable about the beggar named Lazarus. Now, notice again verse 45. Many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. But notice, but some of them went their way to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. Oh, it's just around the hill to Jerusalem. And some of these, they weren't convinced. They just wanted to go and blab and tattle and tell the Pharisees. That's what they were interested in. You see, that's the reason, friend, that God does not rend the heavens and come down. And that's the reason today he's not performing miracles. After the church leaves the earth, during the great tribulation period, and into the millennium, there'll be great miracles performed. But that's not going to convince anyone. You see, if in a quiet way, you cannot trust him when the mob and the majority turn from him, then you do not have faith at all. The great many people say, well, the crowd hasn't gone after Jesus. No, they never did. But he died and was buried and rose again from the dead. And that's the gospel. And you can believe that, friends. And don't tell me that you need a miracle. The problem is not with the evidence we have today. The problem is the unbelief of man. That's where the problem really is. Now, you see, this brought the bloodhounds of hate on his trail again. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we 
for this man doeth many miracles. Now, don't miss that, friend. Now, this is a statement from the enemy. The enemy said, he doeth many miracles. So when I've made this statement again and again when we've been in the Gospels, that the Lord Jesus performed literally hundreds, yea, even thousands of miracles that are not recorded, that I'm not exaggerating. He doeth many miracles. You see, they were not in the favorable position of denying he performed miracles he had. <laughs> and you've got to get in a seminary today, one of these liberal seminaries, to be able to deny Jesus performed miracles. But may I say, you're running to cover when you do that. You couldn't have done it in the days of the Pharisees, and they were his enemies. Now, if we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. Now, the thing they feared about Jesus was that there would be a great mass turning to him and that there would be revolution and that Rome would pounce upon them. In other words, they moved from a basis of fear. That was the thing that motivated them in what they did. They are afraid, and that is the thing that's keeping a great many people away from Jesus today. Well, even in our churches with its little cliques, there's some that haven't the intestinal fortitude to stand on their two feet for what is right and for Jesus Christ. And for those who teach the Word of God, they just sit there like a dumb dog, my friend. They don't even bark to warn at all. Now, will you notice, and one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest, that same year said unto them, ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. This was a strange thing here. And thus spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for the nation. But you see, they are rationalizing it and say, well, he should die rather than the nation die and Rome come upon us, you see and put us to death, which they did, by the way, in 70 A.D. And not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that are scattered abroad. This is a remarkable prophecy, given the gift of prophecy, because he was high priest that year. Now, then from that day forth they took counsel together for to put him to death. This is the beginning of the end, actually, friends. That is exactly what is taking place at this particular time. They are now planning to put him to death. This is his last, actually, public appearance. And Jesus, therefore, walked no more openly among the Jews, but went thence into a country near to the wilderness, into the city called Ephraim, and there continued with his disciples. If they won't believe, Moses why, they will not believe though one be raised from the dead. Now, we come to that which is the last week. And the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand. And many went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then sought they for Jesus and spake among themselves as they stood in the temple, What think ye that he will not come to the feast? Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a commandment that if any man knew where he were, he should show it, that they might take him. This is the breaking point. This is the end. And we'll see that he comes up into a home. We'll visit the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And then we have the marvelous upper room discourse that he gave to his own. We'll move next time into chapter 12. And so until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. You know, there are some really important lessons coming up in our study of John, and now is the perfect time to invite a friend to join us as we listen together. There are a ton of ways that you can do that. Just direct them to ttb.org to check out all their listening options. And remember, ttb.org is also the place that you can catch up on any of the lessons that we've already completed, and you can download our digital book, Briefing the Bible. That contains Dr. McGee's notes and outlines for our study. And if we can help you answer any questions, maybe about the ministry or finding a particular resource, you can call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. That's the number. Again, that's 1-800-652-4253. And you can always write, we love your letters, write to Box 7100, 
Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. Well, I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll be here next time holding open the doors of the Bible bus as we enjoy another great adventure in God's Word together. Jesus made it We're grateful for our committed listening family who faithfully pray and invest in Through the Bible as we together take the whole word to the whole world.